Welcome to worship this fourth Sunday of Advent. In a few days, people around the world will pause to celebrate the coming of good news that is great joy for all who believe. On that day so long ago, the glory of the Lord was revealed, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. We long to see him come again. As we live in this space between celebration and longing, join me in a responsive reading of an Advent liturgy. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. The whole earth is full of his glory. When Christ was born, the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy. We light this fourth Advent candle in celebration of our glorious God, who sent his precious Son, revealing his glory as never before. Please join me in prayer to the one who has come and is coming again. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. In our worship today, in our hearts, and in all that we do, may we glorify you, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As we gather here this morning, the light of the Advent candle continues to grow. It's the good news, as we heard, of great joy, and invite you to stand as we hear God's blessing and receive his welcome as well this morning. To all who gather, receive God's blessing this morning. Grace and peace to you in the name of the one who calls us to himself, in the name of his son, Jesus, who redeems us for himself, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, who calls us again to himself. And together, God's people say, Amen. In a moment, we're going to sing what is considered one of the oldest hymns in the Christian church, Of the Father's Love Begotten. Again, considered to be one of the oldest hymns, it reads like a confession of faith. It tells the story uh, to a lost and a weary world of a love that is not bound by time. Tom's going to play it through once, and then we'll sing it together.
In a few days, uh, as Heather said in the early part of our service this morning, people from around the world are going to gather and celebrate the one who has come full of grace and truth. It's that grace that reminds us that repentance is so much at the heart of Advent expectation. As we hope for Christ's coming and his coming again, we shape and have our hearts ruled by the grace and truth of the one who is God's glory. So let's turn to him in a a communal spoken prayer of confession together in a responsive reading. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Amen. The good news of Advent is in Christ we are made right with God. This is the love of God at work for Jesus' coming means the end of that which keeps us in fear and keeps us far from God. We read in Isaiah 1 verse 18 these beautiful words of the gospel here in this Advent season. Come now, says the prophet, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are as red as crimson, they shall be like wool. These words from the prophet centuries prior to Jesus coming remind us again of the one who is grace and who comes with truth. Jesus, the good news of great joy, the one who comes to save us from earth's dark night of sin. He's the one the prophets proclaim, the one we wait for. We commit ourselves to this child who is yet a king, and we're going to do that through a responsive reading once again, this time uh, based on the beautiful words of Psalm 1, which many consider the great introduction to the entire book of Psalms and all that faith is expressed in those words. Let's do this responsive reading together. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Your word is a lamp to my feet, and a light to my path. Amen. Having seen God's goodness again this morning, receiving his grace, it's our joy to turn to God in a time of uh, hearing from his word. I invite you uh, this morning as we continue our series on a remarkable advent uh, to join me in opening a scripture passage to Matthew 1. Matthew 1 verses 18 through 25. You'll find that in the Pew Bible there in front of you on page 1069. The words will be on the screen in just a moment. So this past year, or at least the past uh, eight or nine months, has been filled with a lot of that is uh, unpredictable. And I don't think I need to say that too many times for you to know that's very true. One of the joys of the Advent season is it plants us again in a very old story. We return to that story again this morning. And as we look at Matthew 1, I'm not going to read verses 1 through 17, but um, that's the genealogy that Matthew accounts for in the coming of Christ. But here we find ourselves again in a story that is older than creation and a story that is still being written. And by God's grace, we find ourselves in that story. We also consider this morning Joseph. Joseph, ordinary Joseph, through him God shows us how how every heart that prepares room for Christ finds not only peace but a place in this amazing story of grace. That's our passage this morning, Matthew 1, verses 18 through 25. Before we hear from God's word, though, join me in prayer once again. Let's pray together. Come, Holy Spirit of God, you who inspired uh, the prophets, 
uh, Moses, many others, including the disciples, to pen these words of faith, remind us again that this is a living word and it can cut through everything. And it is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Do that work in us, we pray, that we might walk by grace in this world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand this time for the reading of God's Word. Stand if you're able and willing to do so. Matthew 1, verses 18 through 25. This is Matthew, the disciple Matthew, his account of uh, the coming of Jesus and uh, his birth. Matthew 1, beginning at verse 18. Listen to God's word for you this morning. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said to the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. This is God's word for us this morning. You may be seated once again. According to Andy Williams, Christmas is the most wonderful time of the year. Oh, and by the way, it's also the hap happiest time of the year. In case you didn't know that, in case you actually haven't heard that song like a bazillion times in, in the last few weeks. Now, why is it, he says? Well, he has lots of things, the reasons for it. He talks about holiday greetings and happy meetings uh, when friends who come to call and and apparently there's going to be much mistletoeing uh, when loved ones come near and, and, and on it goes. Now, obviously, this was written pre-COVID. Andy Williams seems to sum up what Christmas has come to mean for many people, especially here in our Western culture. It's a time to reconnect with family. It's a time to be with friends. Uh, but again, all kidding aside, a, a worldwide pandemic has placed quite a bit of that um, off limits. And therefore, uh, this even in the last few weeks, and I saw it just even yesterday, this idea seems to be percolating up in our culture, and it's a scary idea. And that is that, um, that Christmas might be canceled this year. Uh, I saw a commercial just the other day in which, uh, to assure uh, young children, I presume, but maybe those who are young at heart, that Christmas won't be canceled is that uh, apparently uh, masks are worn even by, by the reindeer this year. Um, peace of mind right there, right? Now I get some of the fear, at least if I'm approaching Christmas from a sentimental uh, point of view. If Christmas is a cultural holiday, which by the way, a scary comment I read this past week is uh, if, if Christmas were canceled, the fact is it would still continue in many, many of its functional ways. If you even removed Christ from the story of Christmas, many people could keep celebrating, mindful or even mindlessly so, of that very fact. It may sound a bit cheesy, but Christmas cannot be canceled, can it? There is, after all, a reason for the season. And it reaches deeper, far deeper than sentimentality that, well, I know I'm being a little critical here. It's not like me so often. But some of the sentimentality that seems to too often rule our day. Now, I say all of that by intro in order for us to enter into the story well. I want you to know, and I think you know that, there is peace in a better story. And that story is the one that we pick up this morning in Matthew chapter 1. It's a story that includes a man named Joseph. Now, even before Matthew gets to specifically to the person, Joseph, he does something quite remarkable. And I want to spend a few moments 
here, just looking at verses 1 through 17, uh, because, and here's the first thing you need to know about, about Joseph, and that, that he is a part of a long chronological story. He is not a fly-by-night kind of person in this sense. God has planned this moment from the dawn of creation. And I, I think just from a faith perspective, that should overwhelm us for a moment. Most of us have an inability to remember things. If you were in my catechism class, you'll know that students in there, I tell them, uh, you are terrible rememberers. I don't even know if that's a word, but you're terrible rememberers because I'm a terrible rememberer too. And then we get to Matthew 1, and God puts together this lengthy genealogy. And now I'm going to go off something that just popped into my head and tell you this is a scary passage for somebody who is 14 years old because that's how old I was when my pastor in my home church asked me to read this passage in front of the church during Advent. And being a 14-year-old, I want you to know that I thought I knew Scripture well enough that I didn't need to practice reading Scripture ahead of time. And now you should be, by this point, pulling out a Bible and going, well, what, what is this passage? And you should be looking at the genealogy with me for a moment and finding out that for a 14-year-old boy, how absolutely mortifying it would be to stand in front of a church and read some of the names on this list. I th like to say, I think it went well. I'm glad to say there is no video. The genealogy of Jesus. Matthew begins with this passage in which he wants you to know, and we need to know, when it comes to, we're looking at Joseph, right? When it comes to God's promise to redeem the world from sin, that there's a story behind the story that is very old. It's God's story. And here's a quick review again. Creation, fall, redemption. In our Reformed expression of faith, we love to talk about these dynamics of Scripture. Creation, fall, redemption. At the very beginning, God created everything to be good. We were to live in community and in a fellowship with the Father. The fall happened, and in this awful moment, this breathtaking disaster, that community was destroyed. But before the dust even settles, Genesis 3, verse 15, God tells us, look, I want you to know I'm securing a way back to myself. It's going to be costly. It's going to involve a descendant of Eve. And then the story of the genealogy comes in three chapters. There's Abraham. God calls one man out of all the nations and says, through you, I'm going to bless the world until one of your descendants is going to be the greatest blessing this world has ever known. Then in the second section of the genealogy, we see David. God calls David forward. And what does God promise David? He says, David, your throne will be forever. One of your descendants will be king for eternity. And then in the third section, we really have the exile phase of the story. It's a hard part of the story. It's a sad part of the story. But as you listen to Abraham and David and the exile, you find out when it gets to Joseph, God has been long at work in this. He has been long in work in telling you that in the midst of all the difficult times and all the difficult periods of, of Israel's story and of your story, in all the times in which there were less than exemplary people in that genealogy, God has been faithful. So the first thing that you and I need to have and know about Joseph is that, well, he's a descendant of David. What does that mean? He is but a part of a beautiful tapestry of God's grace. Outside of anything that Joseph's done, out of anything that he will do, God's grace meets him and Joseph. And that's just simple, the gospel that comes to us even in our Advent expectation. It's grace upon grace upon grace. It's God being faithful to his promise. It's God's never-ending, always and forever love. That's the first thing that you need to know when you think about the Christmas story and Joseph's name comes to mind. He is part of a story of God's never-ending love. He is but one more part in the fulfillment of God's covenant promise. Rooted in his faithfulness. The second thing we're going to talk about as we look at this passage is we have to talk a little bit about Joseph's character. Matthew introduces him as a man who was just and righteous. Now, uh, we're known by a lot of things in our world today, but if you were to walk around and somebody were to say along the way, boy, there's a person who is just and righteous, what would come to mind? 
somebody who does good, somebody who makes good choices, lives wisely, right? Wise and righteous is like code in the biblical language that here's a man who is walking by faith. Uh, that's a code, right? We've looking at the um, uh, we've been studying the book of Romans, and we'll pick it up again in a couple Sundays. Uh, and this is the great story of of the Bible, right? Those who walk by faith. That's that's Joseph. He's righteous and he's just. It means he's living according to God's standards. Big deal? Of course, it's a big deal. You know, I know, it's not easy living by the standards that God has established. But in this tiny little town of Nazareth is one man who happens to also be a part of this great genealogy, the great story of God's unfolding great, is a guy named Joseph who's living by faith. In a world that had to be very much similar to ours in this regard, in a sense he's countercultural, in this sort of sense he's going against the tide of his day, but even so, of Joseph it said, he is a just and a righteous man. And here's why that matters. Because like all of us, it's going to get challenged. Joseph finds out his betrothed, so they're not married yet, but in the Jewish culture, this year-long betrothal is like marriage. It's like they're married. And in order to separate, you still need a divorce, even though they've never had united uh, physically. He finds out Mary is pregnant. Now, remember, he's a just and righteous guy. And let's be honest, it's hard. It's hard for us to be that kind of person. It's not easy for us to do what is right. Sin makes us self-absorbed. Sin makes us self-focused. Look at anyone, if, you're, if we did our service this morning well and you entered into that time of redemption and you, and you had that reflection moment, says, God, my sin is great. Jesus, you're a great Savior. But in that reflection time, you're realizing it wasn't easy for you this past week. Sin makes us self-absorbed. Sin makes us self-focused. And now we find Joseph, and his righteousness stands out. Why? Well, because he's going to do something, or he tries to do something, that is really for the sake of Mary. He places her safety, he places her security ahead of everything else. He makes a plan. That plan is really merciful. It's a merciful solution to uh, divorce Mary in quiet, because uh, by perception, she's been unfaithful. By Jewish law, to be unfaithful is to be stoned, to be set outside, to suffer the consequences. Every perception says Mary's been unfaithful to her vows. A messy public debacle didn't seem wise. And so to shield her, the passage tells us, Joseph comes up with a plan, a private plan, a plan to divorce her privately. And again, this just speaks to Joseph's character. Compassion moves him to come up with this plan. And I think, I, I know this to be true of me, there's something in that that speaks to my heart that says, is compassion my first response? It's hard for us to be just and to be righteous. Well, God gets into the story. He invites Joseph to do what God expects of those who walk by faith. And here we are in this third section. An angel addresses Joseph as the son of David. So all of a sudden, we're back to the genealogy again. Then the angel tells Joseph, hey, you need to know God has a plan. God has a plan. It's a great plan. It's a great plan about a son who's coming, who's born of a virgin. She will give birth to a son. And then here's your part, Joseph. This is the only thing you have to do. And that's humbling. You're just to give him a name. It's a name that's very common and familiar in that Jewish culture in first century Palestine, a lot, of, a lot of little Jesuses were all over the place probably because it was Yeshua or Joshua from the Old Testament. People love that name. And God says, this is the only thing you have to do, Joseph. Just give the child this name. His name is Jesus. And now I want to tell you why that matters. The angel says this is a fulfillment of prophecy. Going all the way back to Isaiah, Isaiah 7, Isaiah 9, all of these passages which spoke of the one who was to come. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. And he's come to save us from our sin. All of that to say, 
we talked about this chronology where Joseph fits into. We talk about his character. And now we have this moment. When you guys hear this, when we hear the good news of, of great joy, it's supposed to do something. In fact, Jesus makes clear in the New Testament, you'll tell, you know, we'll tell that the world that we're belonging to him by the fruit. And here's this fruitful moment for Joseph. The angels come, don't be afraid. Why not? Well, don't be afraid that, that God's voice is the best voice to listen to. Don't be afraid to heed God's voice. Don't be afraid that the sinless Savior is coming who's born of a virgin. And again, this vir I talked about this last Sunday, this virgin conception is so critical to the biblical story. There is no salvation apart from the incarnation. Don't be afraid, the angel says. Don't be afraid to heed God's voice. Take Mary home. And all of this is an obedience moment. It's an obedience moment for Joseph. Whose plan will he follow? If you think it's hard being just and righteous, it's even sometimes harder to live in submission to God's plan. You and I, we struggle with this all the time. Our culture comes at us and tells us, hey, here's how A, B, and C should work. And then we look at Scripture and say, no, that's not how it should work. I'm going to live according to God's plan. Joseph has one of those moments. And this beautiful thing is that Scripture doesn't even make a big deal about it in a way. It just says, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel said. Faithful obedience. He didn't tweet about it, didn't put it on Instagram, wasn't on Facebook. There wasn't a YouTube video about how great Joseph was in that moment. Just a simple, humble obedience. He obeyed. By faith, he took God at his word, and he did what obedience expects of those who trust in God. His, his obedience, in many ways, is uh, if you read the entire Gospel of Matthew, it's a theme of Matthew that he's going to thread throughout this book. And the question is, what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? What does it mean? The relevance of that question has never diminished in almost over 2,000 years. What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? Well, it means to embrace core truths. It really does. There's an orthodoxy to the biblical faith. We profess it. We profess things to be true, things that are rooted in God's covenant promise. Do you remember the genealogy? There are truths that are central to who we are. Among them, the incarnation, the Word made flesh, who dwelt among us. We must recognize that faith is an expression of firm beliefs. But then we need to talk about what we find this discipleship moment in Joseph. Character matters, so does obedience. Character matters. It matters what's going on in here. It matters what is shaping my life. When we live in, in the light and the peace of, of the gospel, it needs to be said of us what's said of Joseph. Like, hey, you know what? There goes a person who is just, and there is a person who goes who is righteous. We aspire to many things in our world. Not all of them are bad. Accomplishments, things that are credited to us as being Milestone moments, those are good things. But here's a spiritual qualification that God says matters more. Your character matters. It matters where your heart is bent toward in this life. It's a discipleship question. What does it mean to be a Jesus disciple? My character matters. The bent of my heart matters. It needs to mirror what it means to be faithful in all times. But faith doesn't happen in a vacuum, so obedience matters too. Knowing God's will isn't enough. Ordinary people, from the very beginning when God called Abraham out, ordinary people who live by faith, God's always made it very clear. He says, look, here's what it means to believe in me, and now follow me. Here's what it means to trust me. I think the writer of, Hebrew, uh, sorry, the writer of, of Proverbs captured this so well, right? Lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Obedience matters. Joseph becomes sort of the proto-disciple in the gospel. Matthew's going to show us through the life and ministry of Jesus all that it looks like from here on out, but here's your first introduction. 
It's all by grace, genealogy. He chose you. It's a life of character, and your conduct matters too. Discipleship. We're supposed to put on display this beautiful story of grace. We are supposed to put on display the story that's older than creation, and it's still being written. And as the story is continuing to unfold, and, and you're part of that story, and I'm part of that story, we have to have a posture that says there are no shortcuts in God's story. It's not going to be easy. But for over 2,000 years, the church of Jesus Christ has found their faithfulness in it, and it's worth it. It's worth it. But we follow the Word made flesh who dwelt among us. You have seen His glory. You have seen the glory of the one and the only who came full of grace and truth, and He says, come find your place in my story, just like Joseph did. For I am Emmanuel, I am God with you, says Jesus. The Gospel of Matthew is really a story that's all about discipleship. And Joseph, again, proto-disciple, first one in some ways, calls us to resilience. It calls us to say, hey, is it, is it worth it? Yes. Because we have a peace in this story that surpasses human understanding. Joseph's part in God's story, just in some ways, just really reminds us of our willingness to take a journey of faith with this Jesus. He was born in a manger, a child and yet a king. Will you follow him? Will you give your life to this one? It will be costly. Know that. I've said here before, sometimes when we share the gospel with people, we don't give them the full story. We need to do this better. Yes, the Father loves you in Jesus. Come to him and find your life forgiven. But you need to know that from that moment on, everything changes. Everything. He calls you to absolute, total commitment. I started out by telling you a little bit about Andy Williams' philosophy about Christmas. You're probably going to hear that song a few more times between now and Christmas Day. I kind of like it, actually. Kind of catchy. The problem with it is it over-sentimentalizes Christmas. If this past nine months have reminded us again, we are not in control. There are things that we're called to do as faithful followers of Jesus, faithful followers of Jesus, to say that He is in control. The danger of over sentimentalizing Christmas is it strips away what peace we can find in the midst of it. Far more than sentimentality, at Christmas we celebrate a Savior who is Christ the Lord and whom our sins are forgiven, which is why Christmas can't be canceled. You can't cancel God's grace. You cannot cancel a story that says walk by faith. You cannot cancel a story that says live by faith either. You cannot. In Christ, we have a peace with God that is far greater than anything this world can offer. And now, in light of this, people of God, we're going to end our service. Go out and be. Be the story that sings. Sings of an old story that's still being written. A story that is full of grace and full of truth, of life that is never ending, of a peace that comes to those on whom God's favor rests. There is a story to be told. Let's sing it. It may not be the hap happiest, but it can be the most peace filled reality of your life and mine. That's why Christmas can never be canceled, ever. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for a joy that is never ending, for the promise of grace that comes. And you're reminding us again this morning here through, through an ordinary man named Joseph. We're chosen by grace. We're called to live by grace. We live for your grace too each day. Remind us again of the simple call of being a disciple of Jesus. Help us to count the cost and say it's worth it for the joy that is set before us. In these next few days, rewire our hearts so that though we experience some disappointment, truly, it does not overwhelm us because there is a peace 
that can never be canceled. In that joy and that peace, may we rise from this place and go to love and serve Jesus in the days to come. In his name we pray this. Amen. As our profession of faith this morning, I invite you to stand as we use together the Belgic Confession, Articles 18 and 19. Let's stand as we profess our faith together. Remember, this faith thing is a truth reality and it's a life reality and we have to combine the two. We don't just say words that we believe. Because of the words that we believe, we're called to live in a certain way. But we profess together in the Belgic Confession what we believe about Jesus and, again, the centrality of the gospel in the fact that he was the word made flesh. I'll read the question invite you to read the answer with me. What do you believe about the Son of God? The Son took the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man, truly assuming a real human nature with all its weaknesses except for sin. Being conceived in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary, by the power of the Holy Spirit, without male participation. How real was his human nature? He not only assumed human nature as far as the body is concerned, but also a real human soul, in order that he might be a real human being. For since the soul had been lost as well as the body, he had to assume them both to save them both together. Was he then both God and man? The person of the Son has been inseparably united and joined together with human nature in such a way that there are not two sons of God, nor two persons, but two natures united in a single person, with each nature retaining its own distinct property. These are the reasons why we confess him to be true God and true man. True God in order to conquer death by his power. And true man that he might die for us in the weakness of his flesh. Amen. You may be seated. I know sometimes you may think that, boy, Pastor Simon, you like all that theology stuff, but I really do like all that theology stuff, and I think good theology leads to great worship. It also reminds us of why prayer is so powerful. We pray in the name of the one whom we just confess together. We're going to spend a few moments in prayer together. A couple quick announcements, uh, reminders uh, for some prayer items. Uh, let's continue to pray for Evie Wenke. Uh, Evie is home, but uh, she is continuing her cancer treatment as well. She's feeling well enough, and she's begun that, that treatment route again. But let's keep that in, in prayer. I want to ask that we keep praying for uh, gospel mis ministries, Kalamazoo Gospel Ministries, for uh, Kalamazoo Loaves and Fishes, and all of their phenomenal ministry of connecting to those in need. Uh, yesterday morning, uh, some of us participated in our monthly mobile food initiative, which is a partnership of several churches in Oshtemo, providing food to families, and we once again serve uh, over 100 families in our community thanks to the ministry of, of loaves and fishes. So please keep them in prayer and uh, in our prayers for the ministries they're doing. I'm also reminded every year around this time, uh, and not that I don't pray for our missionaries, but this time especially this year, uh, why we pray for our missionaries with some earnest. Uh, they're ministering in faraway contexts, and they feel some of that loneliness being far from family and friends. And uh, they're also ministering at a phenomenal time in which the gospel seems to be, uh, people seem to be more receptive to it in light of the Christmas season. So let's pray for our missionaries that much fruit would come as a result of their work in Jesus' name. Let's go to God in prayer together. Loving and promise-keeping Father, we worship you and we seek your face again this morning because of your priceless majesty, because of the glory of your name and the story of your never-ending love for us. Not only did you create us for yourself, even when we sinned, you revealed your glory to us in time in your son, Jesus. In the joy of this light that penetrates 
into the deepest darkness of this world. We fall on our knees in worship this morning. We, we love you, O oh God. We give you praise because you have crowned us, as the psalmist says. You've crowned us with your love and crowned us with your compassion. Thank you, Father, for remembering your promise. Your promise which says you will complete the good work that you began in us. We're ready to live in a world where there's no more brokenness, no more sin, no more death. A world when there is no more mourning or crying or pain. A world where there is uh, no more cancer, no more heart disease, no more freak accidents. A world where there are no more tensions and conflicts and stress. We long for that day. And until that day comes, may your light shine in us. Thank you today. Thank you forever that our lives are now hidden in yours and your life is now growing in ours. And we can walk by faith in this world. We pray this morning for those who do, don't, do not know you yet, who have not yet experienced the joy of your precious grace. Grant them a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ as Savior and of Lord. And God, help us to share this good news of great joy. Help us to make the gospel beautiful and irresistible to others. I pray this especially for those who are serving as missionaries, uh, both here in, in this North American continent, and, but also around the world, oh God. Hearts seem a little more receptive to this good news. May the fruit of their work and the labor of our hearts together combine to see uh, your kingdom come and your will be done. Refresh us for this work. Stir our hearts to this noble cause. God, we pray this morning for those in our community of Christ followers who are, who are dealing with significant challenges. Some of them are in need of, of your physical healing. Many are in need of your spiritual healing and many others of emotional healing. We pray for that, for our children, that you would comfort them each day as, as they treasure your grace. Pray this for our young adults and our elderly members and all of us, O oh God. We pray for a world in which it's crying out for justice. All is not well. And so in whatever way necessary, may we claim Christ as Lord as we love our neighbor through through selfless giving and tender compassion. Thank you for the Kalamazoo Gospel Ministries, for Kalamazoo Loaves and Fishes, and many other agencies that we're, we partner with as they strive to share your mercy. It's a hard and, and sometimes unappreciated work, but may they not grow weary in doing good. Father, we pray for those who are facing temptations that seem unbreakable. Grant them your strength. We pray for those who are struggling under peer pressure. May they find that you, Jesus, are enough for each day. We pray for those who are struggling to find their way. Lead them, O oh Lord, to yourself, that you might guide their steps. As Christmas Day approaches, we thank you, God, for coming to us in Jesus. He is our peace. He is your best love for us, and in his name, May our lives tell the story of this grace, of beautiful mercy. We pray all of this in the name of the one who was born in a stable and yet as our king. Amen. A couple of announcements before we get to our conclusion of our service this morning. A reminder that we are meeting here in this facility for our Christmas Eve service this Thursday at 6.30. It is a candlelight and carol service uh, we are designing and designed the service in light of our COVID restrictions about the number of songs we can sing. So we've lined up some musicians who will, who will also uh, display a wonderful glory of God's grace as they play their music in our service as well. Uh, come and join us. There will be candles to light at the end of the service. We'll conclude by singing that beautiful song, Silent Night, Holy Night. So that's uh, Thursday at 6.30, a joyful time to gather and celebrate the coming of Jesus. If you haven't seen our Heritage Happenings yet, you can pick up a copy at the Information Center. Just some highlighting some ministries happening around us. We're still collecting uh, winter clothing for the Kalamazoo Gospel Ministries. Uh, you'll see an update for the Roshan School that we're supporting. A great uh, 
effort of some of our members supporting uh, the Rashan School in Pakistan, and then some other items in here as well, uh, including uh, ministry to our homebound members. Uh, we're sending cards and, and blessing them in, in that way, so be sure to, to make a note of that. Finally, our offerings and tithes this morning. This is our opportunity in response to God's goodness to show uh, his favor to our world today, and our offerings support the ministry of this church. And our kingdom cause this morning, I believe, is Kalamazoo Gospel Ministries. Could we advance the slide, please? There we go. Kalamazoo Gospel Ministries, yes. Uh, this is formerly known as Kalamazoo Gospel Mission. They now have a larger umbrella of ministry, and uh, we're grateful to support this kingdom cause. You'll see here on our screen some of the work that they're doing uh, in our community, and we hope that you'll support them. The loose change offering this morning uh, will support the work of Kalamazoo Gospel Ministries. Invite you to stand as we come to the end of our service and receive God's blessing from this place. Following the blessing, we're going to sing together angels from the realms of glory. The prophet Isaiah called God's people to his peace with these words. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. He is the Prince of Peace. As we go, may our commitment of faith and our walk of obedience reflect the life that is rooted in Jesus Christ as his disciples. People of God, receive his blessing as you go from this place. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and grant you his peace. Together, God's people say, Amen.